Hello, everybody. Welcome back to AP World History. This is Unit 6, uh, re-upload of Chapter 3. Apparently, last year, I, like, kept it on a single slide. It, like, froze, and I just spent the entire time talking about that single slide or something. Anyway, welcome back. Yes, this is Chapter 3 of Unit 6, and we're going to continue talking about new imperialism, and specifically, we're going to look at Africa today. To quoteth Shakira, waka waka, it's time for Africa. Anyway, all right, so let's go ahead and get started today. So today and uh, the next presentation, which is going to be still up, we're going to look at new imperialism in Africa specifically. And then uh, the next presentation is about Asia and the Americas. So let's go ahead and get started today. So the first lesson objective, how and why internal and external factors have influenced the process of state building. Uh, according to the AP, this is kind of asking you to think about um, basically the indigenous response to imperialism. How did the imposition of European empires over Africa, how did that lead to uh, independence movements, essentially, kind of a way to think about that. How did it lead to motives of resistance against European imperialism? And then uh, 6.4, how do various environmental and economic factors contribute to the development of a global economy? Basically, Europe is going to use Africa, Asia as places to extract raw materials, and thus these places are becoming integrated into an industrial global economy, basically. And we're going to see why there's such an interest in Africa in just a second. So yes, we are looking at Africa in this particular presentation. However, before we look at kind of how European influence will grow, a few things just to understand. For one thing, it is important to note, as I'm sure you all know, that Africa is a very diverse place. There are thousands, literally, of different ethnicities, different languages, different cultures. There are different styles of living, nomadic societies, pastoral societies, sedentary farming communities, etc. So Africa is a very diverse place. But as we're going to see with this presentation, there is a lot of things that happen to Africa without much consideration for the African people themselves, especially this distinctiveness, these identities, these different ethnicities. And that is going to be one of the big long-term impacts on Africa, even to the present day, is that the creation of colonies, specifically colonial borders, that is going to fuel tensions ethnic tensions even to this day, even after colonization. But we will talk about that more uh, later on when we talk about the division of Africa into col colonies based on borders. But hold that, keep that in the back of your mind. Very diverse place. By 1800, we're kind of starting to see that this very wealthy part of West Africa is starting to engage in a period of decline. And there are a few reasons for that. For one thing, generally, we see that kind of the slave trade, one of the long lasting impacts of the slave trade is not only, of course, the diaspora of excuse me, millions of African men, uh, mostly men, but also African women as well, we also see that kind of the process by which African slaves are achieved is mostly through political warfare, mostly through warfare. And yet, because of the ending of the slave trade by 1807, the legal international slave trade by 1807, there suddenly is not just political instability. But there's also going to be economic downturn as well, a major blow to the economy of West African states as a result of the ending of the international slave trade. And yet with the legal end of the slave trade, something the US and Great Britain agreed to in 1807, we still see that the slave trade does continue. It's just within Africa at this point. Specifically, we do see some states, not just in West Africa, but East Africa, trying to hold on to slavery as an economic institution. One such state is the Sokoto Caliphate. But this kind of lingering presence of slavery 
is going to be used kind of as a moral justification, as we're going to see later on, for British powers, excuse me, I should say European powers in general, but specifically the British, to become more present within West Africa, as we're going to see. However, before we kind of look at how things are going to change, what is the African presence, uh, excuse me, what is the European presence in Africa like prior to the end of the 1800s? Well, something that I kind of stressed a lot in Unit 4 is that a big difference between the age of colonization and the age of new imperialism, specifically when it comes to Africa and Asia, is that in the age of colonization, so before the 1800s, before the end of the 1800s, the European presence in Africa and Asia as well is mostly confined to the coastal region, mostly confined to trade posts along the coast of Africa and Asia. And that is something kind of important to understand, a big difference between the age of imperialism, the age of colonization has to do with kind of basically territory. In the age of colonization in Africa and Asia, mostly confined to trade posts. However, after 1870, as we're going to see, European powers are greatly going to expand inland, and we're going to see why and how that is in just a second. But just as a kind of side note, another thing important to remember is that the building of inland colonies in Africa and Asia is most similar to how Spain and Portugal built inland colonies in the Americas. So kind of remember earlier periods of colonization focused on the Americas, trade posts in Africa and Asia. Very rarely do we see settler colonies, and we'll look at some examples of that. Probably the most prominent is the Cape of Good Hope colony down in the southern tip of Africa. This is primarily going to be settled before kind of the uh, late 1800s by Dutch settlers, actually. And actually, uh, I should say by the late 1700s, that is when we start to see a transfer from uh, Dutch control of that territory to British control, and that'll become more relevant later. But just to kind of define some terms, there are some very rarely settler colonies in Africa. Probably the most ex uh, prominent is the Cape of Good Hope, modern day South Africa. It's initially going to be settled by European, excuse me, Dutch settlers known as the Boers or Afrikaners. They kind of mean the same thing, basically. And even if they don't, I don't feel bad. Uh, offending uh, those people of Dutch descent in South Africa because, well, they did apartheid. So we'll talk about that later. So basically kind of what to sum up with all of this really quickly is that Africa is filled with a multitude of different ethnic and cultural groups. And yet, as we're going to see, a lot of the European decision making is going to be done without consideration of these different ethnic groups. And we're starting to see political instability with the ending of the legal international slave trade, but also kind of as a long-term impact of that gun and slave cycle. And finally, the European presence in Africa is confined mostly to trade posts until the late 1800s, as we will see. However, what is going to make things change? Why is Europe going to go more inland? Well, there are a few reasons for that. For one thing, one of the big kind of barriers to inland colonization of Africa prior to the 1870s wasn't necessarily military technology. It wasn't necessarily large African societies that prevented European imperialism, but mostly it had to do with geographic reasons. The interior of Africa, uh, depending on where you're at, if you're in the central part right here in modern day Democratic Republic of the Congo, it is very densely forested, very densely jungled. Uh, tropical areas, of course, normally contain malaria carrying mosquito or mosquitoes carrying malaria. However, by the end of the 1800s, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, new military and transportation technology is going to be discovered. Uh, not discovered, but invented, things like the steamship, but also advances in medicine as well, quinine specifically, which is a type of anti-malaria drug. And these kind of will provide the technical ability to go inland within Africa.
But why else are we going to start to see a change from trade posts to inland colonies? Well, let's take a look at that. Well, probably the biggest political reason why more European colonization will happen within the interior of Africa is having to do with international competition between European states. Kind of this big theme that we're gearing up to with the start of World War I in our next unit is that there is competition along very nationalist lines between European states. They need to prove to each other that they're stronger by gobbling up more territory. And this territory, of course, as we'll see in a second, is mostly kind of used for economic reasons. But kind of this nationalist competition, this desire to maintain a balance of power is a major political reason why imperialism will happen specifically in Africa. Africa is going to be viewed as wide open territory, even though there are, of course, all of these different ethnic and cultural groups living within Africa. Yes. But remember, kind of one of the biggest kind of differences with earlier periods of, uh, of overseas expansion is the influence of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is, of course, going to be a major kind of intellectual, quote unquote, justification for imperialism in places like Africa and Asia. This idea of be of there being superior and inferior groups of people based on a misinterpretation of Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. But probably the biggest motivation of all in the age of imperialism and something that kind of defines the connection with the Industrial Revolution is going to be this idea of economic motivations. And of course, we've talked about this before, but basically it kind of boils down to this. Acquire raw materials you can't get in England for, or well, Europe, I should say in general. Rubber, for example, a heavy demand for rubber during the second industrial revolution. Rubber typically grows on tropical, in tropical areas. So in tropical, in dense forests, it uh, is derived from sap on vines that grow in heavily jungled regions, such as in the Congo, for example. But also, of course, other natural resources, diamonds, palm oil, Palm oil is um, essentially kind of used as an industrial lubricant. Gold as well. A lot of the economies of Europe, there are they are on the gold standard, hence the need for gold from places like South Africa. But of course, there's also this idea of using Africa as a place to sell manufactured goods. Africa, largely unindustrialized, it's going to become economically dependent on receiving manufactured goods from Europe, on purchasing them, basically. But there's also kind of other reasons why. The British specifically, remember, their kind of big deal is how do we get to India more efficiently? So specifically with the British, there will be kind of a desire to create industrial transportation infrastructure to facilitate easier overseas trade. So we will see a couple of examples of this. One of them is going to be attempts to build a transcontinental railroad. It's not going to really work out, but the attempt is there. It's made by a guy named Cecil Rhodes. We'll talk about him later. But probably a more successful attempt is the building of the Suez Canal right here. It's going to connect the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, make it a lot quicker to transport uh, raw materials and manufactured goods for the British. But finally, of course, a big cultural reason that is often given is the idea of civilization, of bringing civilization to, quote unquote, uncivilized, barbaric places of the world. So Europe has this perception. Africa is largely uncivilized, quote unquote. It has not. Uh, it needs to be instructed, basically, in those white uh, European styles of culture and customs. And remember, kind of the reason why civilization is important to talk about, this idea of bringing civilization, is the fact, is the idea that a way that European powers secure political control is by establishing what we call cultural hegemony, establishing cultural dominance over societies in Africa and Asia. But kind of a big unintended consequence of that is that in the spreading of Western styles of uh, thought, inevitably there tends to be, especially among indigenous middle class groups, the development of Western ideas of nationalism. So keep that in the back of your mind. 
But beyond this idea of spreading civilization, mostly uh, we see that kind of some other justifications are given along these moral lines. The British, for example, in West Africa are going to justify their presence there by saying, hey, we're ending the slave trade. If we happen to, you know, control an area that's rich in natural resources, we definitely want like, I don't know, palm oil or ivory or gold. Eh, we might as well take it, you know. Same thing with the French, actually. The French are going to establish a presence in Algeria, modern day Algeria, taking that significant chunk of territory over. Uh, primarily the justification given is going to be the idea of ending the Mediterranean Islamic piracy. Uh, that existed there. All right, so we kind of see the technical reasons why all of this imperialism will happen. But what are some other things? How are we starting to see the growth of European influence? Well, specifically with the British, their presence in West Africa is going to extend beyond military forts uh, that are going to be established, actually, in the with the justification given that they are trying to limit the slave trade so after 1807 we start to see kind of more of a military presence of the british in west africa and the british in west africa are going to take over a lot of territory actually they are going to take over places like nigeria um like ghana for example sierra leone and we'll talk about them in passing a little bit more in the future but kind of this is a explanation for how we start to see more direct European presence. The reason given by the British is ending the slave trade. And yet, of course, the economic motivation to stay in West Africa, even beyond these missions of ending slavery and the slave trade are given. Well, that's something also, of course, going on. The French in particular, they're going to be in North Africa and much of West Africa. And the reason why the kind of first inland colonization will begin with the French is a desire to end Islamic piracy. There was a bunch of Muslim pirates in the Mediterranean, basically, and they were based out of Algeria. So the French government is going to kind of, uh, in order to stay competitive with our boys, the British, we are going to see that the French will establish Algeria as their colony. They will brutally take it over. It's a very brutal conquest by the French. And really, the French are going to try and eradicate kind of the native uh, Arab-speaking native uh, Berber populations uh, by trying to outdo the population in a way, by trying to kind of establish more of a French colonial presence there. Algeria is a good example of a settler colony. It will have a significant French settlement uh, because the French government is looking not only to stay competitive with the British, but also to kind of provide economic opportunities for its citizens. And you do that by taking over another country, by taking over another society. And the French, as we will definitely see throughout this unit, they're very aggressive in trying to promote their culture in colonized societies. And the political reason for this is essentially to make sure that these native groups of people are good French citizens. They're good citizens, a part of the empire. They're not likely to rebel, basically. However, we also see that kind of the increased European presence in the interior of Africa is going to kind of be fueled by tales of what is within the interior of Africa, noting all of the natural beauty, noting all of the natural resources. And we do see the kind of the reports of European explorers, guys like Henry Morgan Stanley and David Livingston. They are going to be uh, definitely, their accounts of Central Africa are going to be used by different governments across Europe to justify imperial expansion. For example, the Belgians, who are probably the worst in Africa, although uh, it's kind of difficult to compare the relative worstness of Europeans in Africa, since they're all terrible. But the Belgians are going to actually kind of become more interested in the interior of the Congo, actually, thanks to the commissioning by Leopold II, the King of Belgium, of Henry Morgan Stanley right here. He's going to see what Congo has to offer, the Congo River Basin has to offer, and essentially that will lead to kind of more Belgian presence in Africa, for example.
So kind of the slide right here is basically kind of walking you through how do we start to see this slow but steady move towards the interior of Africa? Well, kind of we see more military presence uh, in the case of the British in this idea of ending the slave trade. But we also see more French presence as well with their invasion of Algeria. But kind of Europeans are realizing the natural resource wealth of the interior of Africa, thanks to explorers like Stanley and Livingston. And all of this is going to unleash an unprecedented period of world history known as the Scramble for Africa. And the Scramble for Africa specifically describes this event right here. It describes the sudden wave of European imperial conquest of Africa. And mostly this is done through a variety of means, through military conquest, but also sometimes through diplomacy. This diplomacy is mostly kind of what we would call an unequal treaty. We'll talk about that more with China, actually. But basically, a lot of these treaties will be signed either through force, through intimidation, or through bribery, or just simply not telling them what's in the treaty, kind of something that... Uh, if you, uh, yeah, if you don't speak the same language, you can kind of work out the treaty any way you'd like, basically. So the Scramble for Africa is going to describe how many Afri excuse me, many European societies, like the Germans, for example, like the Belgians, like the French, like the British, like the Portuguese, all of these powers are going to establish their own slice of Africa. And that's kind of what this political cartoon is depicting right here. European leaders are looking for a way to divide up Africa amongst themselves. Because, and this is going to be kind of leading to a concern if in a way, because the division of Africa into different colonies has the potential to start an international conflict. Because African land is so heavily desired by European states, they want as much of it as possible. So in order to kind of prevent disputes from occurring over territorial borders in Africa, we see that all the heads of European governments are going to meet together in an event known as the Berlin Conference. The Berlin Conference is going to be head by the Chancellor of Germany, a guy by the name of Otto von Bismarck. We'll talk about him more later. But essentially, the Berlin Conference is going to kind of set the borders of these European colonies within Africa, trying to kind of create a more balanced situation in Africa. At the end of the day, it's not really fair to anyone involved, especially African leaders, as I'll talk about in a second. But it is going to kind of lead to long-term feelings of competitiveness between European uh, powers over having more territory in Africa. In particular, the French and the British really don't like the Germans and their presence in Africa. But the Berlin Conference, the basic thing it's going to do in world history is it's going to divide Africa along borders. And obviously, there were states in Africa well before this period. There were, uh, obviously, we've talked about them in the past. But this Berlin Conference is going to kind of create European ideas of border drawing. And European borders are very strict and firm where they're at. There's no crossing without permission, without passports, basically. So the division of Africa along these colonial borders the border is still today of the modern countries of Africa is going to have a lot of impacts on the long term existence of African societies, because all of these borders were made without really any consideration of native Africans themselves. So the creation of European borders in Africa has a few impacts, especially on ethnicities in Africa. For one thing, the building of these borders is going to kind of divide land, basically. Obviously, that's what borders do. But the effect of that is going to make it harder for pastoral and migratory groups to travel from their traditional pastures, basically. So the drawing up of borders, of very strict borders that are going to be tightly enforced by European powers who all hate each other, 
is going to limit the movement of migratory and pastoral native African groups. That's one impact on these African communities. But it's also going to arbitrarily divide up different ethnic communities. And ethnic communities will become split, actually. The majority will be in one colony, for example, and the minority will be in another one. But on top of this kind of division of majorities and minorities, we see that the language of European ideas of race are kind of becoming mixed in all of this. Because a minority group tends to not be well-liked by the majority. And as we will see after independence, kind of an unfortunate long-term influence of European imperialism, is the introduction of these ideas of ethnic superiority, these ideas of racial superiority that oftentimes do lead to atrocities against ethnic minorities in places. A terrible example of this is Rwanda, actually. And we'll talk about Rwanda a little bit more later today, actually. But the division of Africa into colonies is having a few impacts. I've already mentioned a few of them. It's dividing uh, it's preventing the movement of migratory people and pastoral people. It's also going to lead to uneven distributions of different ethnicities that can't really kind of unite together because they are broken up based on European colonial borders. And a long-term impact of that is ethnic conflict after independence. And one more thing of note at the Berlin Conference is that even though no native leaders were invited, a proposal is going to be adopted, at least in theory, by all of the European powers in, uh, present at this meeting. And they're all going to say, we're going to treat Africans humanely. We have a responsibility. It's our white man's burden to spread civilization to them. And we can't spread civilization if they're all dead, basically. So... Even though on paper they're supposed to treat Africans humanely, it's not going to necessarily work out for them. And then just one more thing. Remember, kind of a big concern by European powers is maintaining a balance of power. Make sure that no one single power has all of the territory to make sure that there is an even distribution of economic and political power. And that's kind of more important for our future discussions of World War I. So you should be able to uh, note how and why Europeans will increase in their political presence in Africa. All right. And before we continue by looking at specific areas, a few things of note here. African responses to Europeans. Because we see a variety of different ones. For one thing, we have military resistance, and there are some examples of that. Oftentimes, this will result in the building of new kingdoms, for example. The Zulu kingdom, as we'll talk about later, is a really great example of this. So military resistance tends to be one way indigenous people resist. And that's similar with India, for example, with the Sepoy Rebellion. But military resistance, that's one way. And kind of a long-term impact of this is that the creation of these military-based uh, political units does lead to the development of nationalism. And oftentimes what we see happen is that in order to bridge the gap between ethnic groups, a lot of African nationalist independence movements, which heavily, by the way, borrow from European liberalism and European ideas of the Enlightenment so far, is going to um, be one of the other major long-term impacts of European imperialism in Africa, the development of nationalism. So nationalism is going to be one major way African and, of course, Asian societies will resist imperialism. There will not be any successful independence movements until after World War I, and we won't see decolonization fully happen until World War II, actually, for a majority of Africa and Asia. But we'll talk about that in the future. So really good examples of these development of military resistance. We have the Zulu in South Africa. That's probably the biggest and best example I can think of. But there's also instances of rebellion in West Africa as well. Samurai Toure, uh, and I'll talk about him very briefly later.
And yet, even though there will be pushback against imperialism, a lot of African indigenous people saying, hey, no, 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 Europe, you can't colonize us. We are an independent nation. There is going to be on some level in some societies, especially something encouraged by European powers is cooperation. So we often see that much like with India, a lot of the colonial governments in Africa will be mostly made up of cooperating or collaborating native elites. These are people that had powerful positions in an African state before European imperialism. And they believe that if they welcome, if they collaborate, if they work with European empires, maybe they can keep those social positions. And there are a few examples of this. Uh, for example, in West Africa, I mean, the colonial government there is going to be made up of over uh, thousands of native African elites that work for this colonial government in, in jobs like translators and government officials like tax collectors. So cooperation is one way African elites will uh, uh, respond to European imperialism. A really good example of this is the Sultan of Zanzibar, uh, to just use one example. But also we have generally this idea of making a secondary empire, meaning that Europe is going to extend their influence over a society uh, by establishing them as protectorates. And we'll talk about that more later. But the Sultan of Zanzibar, good example of cooperation. He's going to keep his position as a sultan. In exchange, he's going to allow for a British military presence there and also a lot of economic privileges to sell manufactured goods, basically. But we also see modernization. It's sometimes also uh, called westernization. And in this context, they mean basically the same thing. Essentially, modernization is reforming a government or economy to be more like Western Europe, to resist Western imperialism, basically. And there are a lot of examples of this in Ethiopia, for example. Uh, King Menelik II, he is going to westernize his military. He's going to buy imported, manufactured uh, weapons. Well, obviously weapons are manufactured, but he's going to buy weapons from European powers. He's able actually to resist invasion by, say, the Italians, actually. So there's one successful example of modernization, King Menelik II. But we also have guys like Muhammad Ali as well. And we'll talk about Muhammad Ali in a future chapter. But Ali is the governor of Egypt, actually. And he's looking for independence, not just from the Ottoman Empire, but also from the British economic imperialism as well. He's going to try and industrialize his economy, try to modernize it. And yet, even though there will be a lot of examples of modernization, of creating more modern, aka Western European styles of government and the economy, for the most part, this modernization, while it is done to prevent economic imperialism or straight up direct colonial rule, it mostly is unsuccessful. And Muhammad Ali is a really good example of that. All right, so you should be able to know the different ways African states responded to imperialism. There are three I gave you. All right, so let's look at new imperialism in Africa. So what about South Africa? Well, I've been kind of mentioning them a lot today, and it is a good area to discuss for a lot of reasons. For one thing, South Africa is going to see a lot of economic development uh, thanks to the work of British transnational companies. We're also going to see South Africa as a good example of military resistance and other forms of resistance by indigenous people against European powers, namely the Dutch at first and then the British. Uh, South Africa, also a good example of a white settler colony, as we'll see in a second. So South Africa initially settled by the Netherlands uh, until the 1700s, the late 1700s, in which we are going to see the British formally take over South Africa. Why did the British take over South Africa? It's a result of the Napoleonic Wars, but it's also a kind of military strategy uh, that the British want to start to develop. They want to have the uh, basically the outposts to get to India. And if you have a colony on the southern tip of Africa, because remember, there's no Suez Canal, then you have at least one stopping point for your trading ships and your military ships. All right, 
And then just something to keep in the back of your mind, we also do see that there is tension not just between Europeans and the natives of South Africa, but also between the European powers themselves, the British, of course, over the original Dutch settlers, the Boers. Let's look at some resistance examples. I'm going to look at two, actually. And one of them is the creation of the Zulu Kingdom. So it's not directly Western-inspired nationalism, but the idea of a military alliance made up of different uh, ethnic groups of South Africa, that's an example of military resistance. And you can almost say it's a form of nationalism as well as making a nation-state identity in resistance to the European presence there. The main figure we associate with this rise of the Zulu kingdom is Shaka Zulu. He is going to be one of the earliest leaders of the Zulu kingdom. But we see that kind of this creation of a Zulu kingdom is specifically designed to resist European presence, whether that be the Dutch Boer settlers or the British when they eventually come over by the end of the 1700s. And this does lead to the rise of Zulu kingdoms. The Zulu empire is made up of different smaller sub-kingdoms. For example, what will become the modern-day states of Swaziland and Lesotho. These places uh, kind of have their origins, their roots, you can say, with this creation of the Zulu kingdom. But also, as a military alliance, the Zulu are going to conduct a campaign against the Europeans in their South African homeland. And this is, and I, I say Europeans because this includes both the Dutch and the British, kind of the Dutch settlers and the British colonial governors, basically. And the Zulu are going to have a big war against the British. It's called the Anglo-Zulu War. It's another great example of military resistance by a indigenous group against the empire, the British empire in this case. And the Anglo-Zulu War, actually, there are some successes for our boys, the Zulus, actually. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, why do Europeans dominate in West in, in, in Africa in general? Military technology. That's the main reason why. Repeating rifles, Maxim guns, all of these things allow for the technological edge over European, uh, excuse me, over African states. But we also see that the uh, creation of South Africa as a colony, not just by these Dutch settlers, but by the British as well, is going to lead to kind of a unfortunate impact in the sense that there will be an erasing of native culture, the uh, kind of pushing out of indigenous people off of their land in favor of white settlers who are going to settle within the interior of Africa, the Boers moving to the interior, that's called the Great Trek, just as a kind of side note. But this is does lead to the displacement of a lot of African groups of people. And that is also going to lead to another example of military resistance as well. And that's actually going to be one done by a ethnic group called the Hoxha. And I mispronounced that. I know I'm very sorry to all of my Hoxha fans out there. But this is something known as the Hoxha cattle killing movement. And I kind of gave an incorrect definition in class, so I apologize. But the Hoxha cattle killing movement is a form of resistance by native South Africans against British dominance in the region. And essentially, kind of the idea is by this very religious, very traditionalist movement is going to be the idea that we can kind of unleash spirits against the British presence by killing off our cattle. And this unfortunately does lead to kind of mass atrocities in a way. We do see the uh, the starvation of the Hoxha people, the near starvation of them because of their resistance against the British presence in South Africa. So it is kind of a, another form of an example of indigenous resistance to European imperialism. The idea of if we kill our own cattle, this will provide some spiritual uh, means by which we can end imperialism. All right, so South Africa, there are some examples of military and uh, other forms of resistance uh, in uh, by indigenous groups there. But also, let's take a look at South Africa's economy, because I said that uh, the inclusion in the global economy is a big theme of this unit, and it definitely is. Let's see the economic development of South Africa. Well, South Africa primarily has gold and diamonds and emeralds, too. 
So we see that kind of a, the idea of including into a wider overseas economic connection is mostly done to acquire raw materials, in the case of South Africa, gold and diamonds. But one of the biggest figures we associate with kind of expanding South Africa specifically and Africa in general into the global economic sphere is guys like Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes or Cecil Rhodes, I don't really care because he's a racist. Cecil Rhodes, um, he is a big figure in South African history, politically and economically. Economically, the big kind of connection he has with connecting South Africa to the global international market during the age of imperialism is going to be his sponsorship of the transnational company known as the De Beers Company. So the De Beers Company is a good example of a transnational company that will be allowed by European governments to work within Africa, specifically in this case, and Asia. So the De Beers Company, transnational company, is going to spearhead a lot of the economic development in the form of mines, especially in South Africa. But we also see that Cecil Rhodes is a big proponent of railroad development. How do we get these raw materials quicker to England? We need railroads. We need uh, railroads. That's the biggest thing. If you have to associate anything with Cecil Rhodes, railroad development, telegraph, anything like that, Just kind of anything uh, that's a big theme of this union, I should say, is the encouragement of industrial infrastructure is a way to centralize economic and political power over African states, basically, and Asian states as well. So economically, Cecil Rose is a good example of inclusion in the wider economic system because of this transnational company that is regularly trading between Africa and Britain itself, with Europe, with Britain itself. However, another thing uh, that I kind of mentioned is that Cecil Rhodes is important politically as well. He's going to be actually one of the first political leaders of South Africa. South Africa is going to be kind of given a lot of self-government. There's a significant white settler population there. So Britain's not too worried that uh, they can't handle themselves. So South Africa will have a degree of home rule or self-independence, self-government, even though it's technically still a part of the British Empire. But how is that kind of political control established more firmly? Well, it has to do with something known as the Boer Wars. Essentially, it's a conflict between the Boers and the British. The Boers want independence, they want the ability to rule over South Africa as they want to. They're going to establish an independent country called the Orange Free State. And basically kind of in protest, the Boers declare independence, but the British respond in kind by decimating their community. Well, not decimating, that gives them kind of some sympathy points. No, by severely, very brutally treating the Boers. The Boers are going to be locked into concentration camps, actually. And this does lead to international outrage. Everyone in the world is going to be like, oh, no, Britain, you can't do these horrible things to the Boers in South Africa. And kind of the war will end. Once a kind of negotiated peace is signed, the British are going to establish full control over South Africa, but as a concession, they're going to allow for self-government. They're going to allow the white population of South Africa to decide their own internal matters, their own kind of internal concerns, how they want to set up their government. And one way these white Southerners, uh, well, South Africans, I should say, want to set up control over South Africa is by instituting racial hierarchies. Remember, one of the big kind of things about imperialism is that oftentimes colonial administration is administered through reinforcing or creating ethnic or racial hierarchies. And in the case of South Africa, a way that is established, that control is established, is going to be by allowing the white settlers of South Africa to openly and legally discriminate against people of color. And I say people of color, not just Africans, but native, uh, but Indians coming in, migrant Indians, and mixed race people as well. So apartheid describes the system of racial hierarchy between white South Africans and African South Africans, people of African descent. 
And by the way, those white South Africans include guys like Elon Musk's family, but that's a different story. Okay. So the Boer Wars will lead to more direct British control, but we also see, or I should say more firm British control, but it also does see the creation of a white settler colony, one that has absolute political dominance in controlling the South African government, preventing elections for black South Africans, but also in the sense of a racial hierarchy like apartheid. West Africa, what are the big things there? Gold, ivory, palm oil, natural resources. How did the British get there? Well, they wanted to stop slavery. And some examples of colonies they're going to build, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a colony that the British make basically as a place to kind of uh, uh, free any captured uh, slave ships they find. So you come across a slave ship, all the crew, all the cargo, the slaves themselves are still alive. Well, how do we do we return them to their homeland? No, well, uh, things could be falsified. So let's just dump them all in some place called Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone, that's kind of what's unique about it. Nigeria, the British do a very brutal war against the people of Nigeria that, that belong to the Asante group specifically. Ghana also exists. That's mostly done through diplomatic negotiations. The French, the French want to stay competitive with the British. And under Napoleon III, which is Napoleon the Bonaparte's grand uh, nephew, I should say, he wants to stay competitive with our boys, the British. So we do see that the French are going to be a big presence in West Africa. This map right here is not necessarily the places that the French owned during the age of new imperialism, although with the exception of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all of them basically are former French colonies. But the map specifically describes French-speaking regions of Africa to this day. So you can kind of see that a big part of French imperialism imposition of French culture over societies in West Africa and in Vietnam as well, as we'll talk about more later. So all of this is going to be met with some resistance, actually. One example of resistance is the Samri Toure Wars, in which a African, West African chief is going to lead a rebellion against French colonial rule. It's brutally put down because of unequal military combat, but still nonetheless is an example of imperialism and how it leads to resistance. The only one kind of thing that sometimes pops up on AP prep materials is that Liberia is an independent state, actually. It's one of the two independent states in uh, and in Africa in general during the age of imperialism until the 1930s. Liberia is technically kind of used by the Americans as a place to free their slaves. The United States, as you'll learn about more next year, has this movement emerging. It's called the American Colonization Society. And essentially, this colonization society is like, we hate black people in the U.S., but we also hate slavery. Why don't we ship freed slaves to Africa? And because of the kind of implied protection of the United States over Liberia, we do see it's not going to become a, um, whatchamacallit, it's not going to become a colony. East Africa, what's the big thing about East Africa? It's a secondary empire. Secondary empire essentially describes uh, a protectorate in a way. That's kind of one way to view it. But secondary empire in a sense is allowing for local traditional elites to have some social and local power in exchange for economic or military concessions. We have a right to trade here. We have a right to have our military stationed here. That could be a part of this negotiated uh, secondary empire. The best example is the Sultan of Zanzibar. The Sultan of Zanzibar, he is the Sultan of a small region of modern day Tanzania called Zanzibar. And essentially kind of the Sultan of Zanzibar is going to agree to have a British military presence in Zanzibar, one that will support his rule, so he doesn't have to uh, make his own westernized army. But in exchange, the Sultan promises not only to provide an area to sell manufactured goods, but also their help in ending the East African coast slave trade. And yet it is important to note that as a continuity within Africa, kind of something that will stay the same, unfortunately, is slavery. 
All right, so that's East Africa for the most part. Mostly, this is a place where Britain is establishing colonies to kind of promote trade to India, to provide places to sell manufactured products. But East Africa is also notable because it has another example of successful modernization and resistance. Ethiopia is going to be independent thanks to the modernizing efforts of King Menelik, Emperor Menelik II right here. Menelik II is going to purchase European firearms, I believe from Great Britain, and use those military firearms to resist Italian invasion. So Ethiopia won't become a colony, actually. It will get invaded in the 1930s, but we'll talk about that later. All right, Egypt, another example of a secondary uh, empire, you could say, because it is going to be a British protectorate. But let's kind of see the process by which it will become a British protectorate. And it's an example of economic imperialism. And it's also an example of how governments are involved in the creation of industrial economies, at least the attempt to. So Egypt, why are the British interested in it? Cotton and the Suez Canal. However, even though the British kind of have dollar signs in their eyes when they're looking at Egypt, Muhammad Ali, who is the governor of Egypt, is going to try and resist not only European formal imperialism, but informal imperialism as well. And he's going to try and do that by modernizing the economy. He's going to try and industrialize. Uh, we'll see how well that works out for him. But he's also, and we also talk about it more in um, our fourth chapter, so our next chapter after the next presentation. So Muhammad Ali is going to try and industrialize, try and not be dependent on Britain for manufactured goods. He's also going to try and westernize the government as well to try and make it more efficient uh, and more centralized. However, these modernization efforts mostly fail, and the British are going to kind of establish their presence over places like Egypt. And there are a few reasons why it might have failed. For one thing, it costs a lot of money to industrialize. But for another thing, we kind of see that the British military presence, there is going to be a lot of British military presence in Egypt, especially after Napoleon's invasion in the late 1700s is that the British military puts pressure on Egypt to try and not industrialize, basically. And one way that states outside of Western Europe try and industrialize is basically making the uh, foreign competitors their goods more expensive by having a tariff. Remember, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. However, the British military presence in Egypt oftentimes kind of carries a threatening aura, you could say. There is military pressure to repeal tariffs, for example. And because of this, British manufactured goods that tend to be produced a lot more quickly and a lot more cheaply are going to dominate Egypt and thus undermine its economic independence and its ability to industrialize. But also the Egyptian government has to take out a lot of loans from the British. The British are going to be willing, ready, willing, and able to conduct uh, loans with Egypt. And a lot of these loans, much like we'll see with Latin America, can't really be paid back. And unfortunately, how does Egypt pay it back? By granting land to the British to build the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal is going to only lead to further military presence in Egypt, so much so that Egypt essentially becomes the uh, uh, protectorate of the British Empire. And because of this, we kind of see that Egypt will have some independence, but on in theory, it's basically controlled by the M, uh, by the British Empire. Uh, we see that kind of Egypt also has another example of military resistance against European imperialism that comes in the form of the Metis Revolt. The Metis Revolt essentially was a example of military resistance forming along ethnic and religious lines. And the Metis Revolt essentially is a huge rebellion by a Sudanese individual who resists the invasion of his country by the combined forces of the uh of the um of the Egyptians and the British. And the British are going to put down this revolt, this rebellion by a guy named Muhammad Ahmed. He's also called the Mehdi, the Mahdi, which is a Islamic millenarian uh, position. It's a kind of a foreteller of the end times, basically. And it kind of uh, what we see is the defeat of this Sudanese threat at the Battle of Omdurman. 
All right. So what is life like under colonization? Well, generally, we see are seeing uh, some changes. For the one thing, we see that those traditional leaders that don't collaborate with the European powers, they're typically going to lose their local authority. And all of this is because governments in Africa and Asia are centralizing their power, and that is coming at the expense of local traditional leaders. We also see environmentally and econ economically the creation of monocrop cultures, monocrop uh, planting in Africa. And mostly this is done for raw materials, i.e. things like cash crops or lumber or sugar, etc. However, we also see some changes in terms of gender as well, because one of the big impacts of imperialism economically is actually going to be the introduction of capitalism, is going to be the introduction of wage economies into Africa. And because of this, we do see that oftentimes women will take on traditionally female roles. Another explanation for this is that a lot of men are going to migrate overseas, as we'll talk about later, but women are going to take on roles outside of the home. Typically, if we see, if we ever see a chart, for example, that has a lot more women than it does uh, men in a colonial society outside of Africa, it might be because uh, that uh, those women had to take those roles, basically. However, despite the fact that women are working outside of the home, we do see that this introduction of wage work does oftentimes carry with it the implications, the cultural values of gender roles from Africa. African women, African, uh, excuse me, African women, Asian women are going to be forced to kind of um, not do practices considered barbaric by European powers, not to, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some, but to limit the speaking of traditional languages, to limit the movement of migratory and pastoral groups, to wear more traditional European clothing, but also to adopt European ideas of gender as well. Women have to be subservient to husbands. That's a huge difference from earlier periods of African history where there were matrilineal societies. There were societies that had more prominence for women. Biggest economic impact I can think of, economic introduction of wage economies. Oftentimes, this kind of introduction of wage economies does lead to migration of Africans elsewhere. We see that some Africans will uh, travel and uh, relocate into a new position somewhere else. And sometimes this is done voluntarily. Sometimes it is coerced through indentured servitude, but I'll talk about that later. And yet, despite the fact that wage economies are being introduced, despite the fact that there is this insistence by the Berlin Conference to have a uh, nice treatment, I guess you could say, of Africans, there are very in there are terrible instances of very low pay, a very brutal work. And you can almost say that these are motives for resistance against imperialism, the very brutal economic and political conditions of African people. Excuse me. And a really terrible example of this very brutal treatment in coerced labor as well, done by a European colony, is the Belgians in the Congo. Um, and the Belgians in the Congo are not unique in that they are terrible in their treatment of African groups. That that honor and distinction can go to other European societies, but the Congo are very brutal. The Belgians in the Congo are very brutal in their imposition of colonial rule. And who owns the colony of the Congo? Well, it's the Belgians, actually. And the Belgians are ruled over by this guy named Leopold II. Leopold II in this scramble for Africa during the Berlin Conference, is going to kind of negotiate with other European powers to recognize Leopold's hold personally over the wide Congo Basin. He's going to promise to open it up to free trade, and that he does, and that's why it's called the Congo Free State. But Leopold II is going to use this Congo Free State as basically his own personal colony. He's going to use it to gain wealth for himself. He's going to raise a local army called the Force Publique, and it is going to be made up of local collaborating Africans. And these local collaborating Africans are going to be used by the Belgians, by Leopold II, to collect rubber. Rubber is the 
biggest commodity produced in the Congo. And it is going to be an area where the where Leopold is going to get very wealthy. Uh, and in a way, he is going to get this wealth by very brutally treating the people of the Congo. Excuse me. And before we look at that idea of brutal treatment of Africans by Leopold, uh, I just want to kind of see some other instances that are connected to the Belgians in Africa. For one thing, we also see that uh, in order to maintain rule, sometimes European powers tend to prefer some ethnic groups over others. And this is essentially making it harder to create and develop nationalism. And one example of the Belgians in Africa encouraging racial hierarchies is between the Hutus and the Tutsi. The Tutsi are a smaller ethnic group in modern-day Rwanda, and they are going to be considered based on race science, based on racist uh, social Darwinist thinking, that they are somehow superior to the more to the majority of Rwandan people, the Hutu. So kind of the Belgians are going to encourage ethnic conflict by favoring one group over the other, by introducing ideas of racial superiority that will become very important after we talk about decolonization. There will be ethnic and political violence that happens after decolonization. But we also see that the Belgians are unique and that they will commit very brutal atrocities in the Congo region. And uh, this includes a lot of things like mutilation and execution by the Belgian uh, collaborating uh, military that the Belgian government forms within um, within the Congo. And we see kind of a big legacy of it is very much going to be the literal disfigurement of millions of people. It's estimated that 7 million people, 10 million people actually die uh, during Leopold's reign over uh, the Congo, actually. And we see kind of a terrible example right here um, with this figure right here, Nasala, actually. His, um, he failed to meet a rubber quota, and unfortunately his wife and his child were punished by them being killed. And actually, I censored this image a little bit, but he is looking at the severed hand of his daughter, unfortunately. This is a uh, a journalist piece, actually, about Leopold in the Congo. Um, if you'd like to read over it, it's certainly available for you, but it's not required reading. All right. So last thing on a grim note, what are the impacts of imperialism? Social impact? Well, the creation of these colonial borders is going to lead to ethnic conflict. The enforcement of racial hierarchies also leads to long-term ethnic conflict. And the reason why I brought up the Hutu and the Tutsi in particular in Rwanda is that that is kind of the context for the Rwandan genocide. During the age of imperialism, the setting up of these colonial uh, racial hierarchies does translate to post-independence ethnic violence. Economically, we see a lot of things being introduced into Africa, wage work or capitalism, industrial infrastructure like railroads and canals, those are being introduced. We are seeing, of course, the exploitation of African raw materials, rubber, gold, diamonds, ivory, etc. And yet at the same time, these infrastructure projects are mostly controlled by Europeans, by European transnational companies. There's very, very little in terms of of uh, economic independence by these African states. South Africa is probably the closest, but still, nevertheless, we do see that most industrial advancements in colonial societies tend to be owned and operated by Europeans, by Western powers. All right, politically, what's the impact? Well, we see that the desire for more territory by African, uh, excuse me, by European states within Africa does lead to competition and that is going to be something that will be important when we discuss World War I later. There's going to be kind of lingering uh, resentment after the Berlin Conference over who got what territory. And that will eventually kind of be something that will be brought up in the uh, build up to the First World War. But we'll talk about that later. All right. And finally, as you all know, 
European imperialism in places like Africa and Asia will inspire the rise of nationalism as a means to resist imperialism. That's just a big continuity and something to know about this particular unit of world history. All right. So that is everything today, actually. There's a time-lapse video. I didn't show that in class, actually. I could have, but I didn't. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Have a good night, actually. It's like 1120 on my end. Have a great day. Gosh, bless you.